The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hymn 210. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose Son Jesus is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us by name and follow where he leads. Who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. The first reading this morning is from Acts, chapter 2. Those who had been baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Our psalm this morning is from uh, Psalm 23. We will say it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still water. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me 
all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading is from 1 Peter. It is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For, this you, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live forever right in righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him, because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. 
Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a wonderful Sunday. What a wonderful time to come back. This is affectionately referred to as Good Shepherd Sunday, for good reason. Right? We have this wonderful lesson that we all know so well, and it strikes a chord with us because as we, as we hear of the Good Shepherd, as we, as we recite the psalm for today, we may also have in mind the, the prophecies of the, of the slaughtering of the sheep, the Passover sheep, and of course, the sacrifice of the Messiah, like we have here in the window. The sheep is a, is a prevalent and, and dominant image in Scripture and in our understanding. So it is with a joy that we say again this psalm, psalm that many, I think, know by heart. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. That is without a doubt and statistically the most popular psalm of all the psalms. In fact, there was a time in American history, and if you watch any of the old movies, like uh, 18th, 1800s, the Wild West, where somebody was always getting shot and there was always a, a scene with them up on Boot Hill, gathered around, and you had the preacher who was out there as the only person with a book. And when the preacher got done reading, by the way, that was usually a Bible, when the preacher got done reading out of that Bible and saying the words at the graveside, he would lead the congregation or the townsfolk in prayer. And those two prayers that always were read or not read because they were always memorized was the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm. That way, that way everybody, when you were taught, when you were a child, you were taught the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm so that you could recite that both at somebody's grave and on your own for comfort. When Jesus started speaking in the Gospel today, you would think that the people who are listening would recall the 23rd Psalm. I mean, who was in the crowd? This was a crowd of uh, a, a, a vastly dispersed population. So you had the group that was there that had been following Jesus through this ministry and had seen miracles and wonders and believed he was who he was. But there were also those who were coming to him because they heard who he was or heard what he was doing and were unsure. I mean, my mom used to tell me, don't believe anything you see or half the things you hear. Wait, it's the other way around. Don't, don't believe, only believe half the things you see and anything you hear because people can say anything about anyone. I can remember mom telling me, if somebody comes up to you and tells you that Susie's done this and John's done that, do not listen to them. Because they could be telling you that because they've got it in for Joe, or in for Susan, or in for Nancy. And you don't know what's really happened, especially if the person that is repeating this information wasn't a first-hand witness. If they heard it from Tony or from Alice, then you're getting it second-hand, good Lord, fourth-hand, 24th-hand. Don't do it. In fact, you know, back in the day, it was, it was genteel, it was polite, it was the right thing to do to tell people when they came and shared information with you about somebody else to tell them you didn't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that. Would you like a tea or a, cook, a cookie or, or whatever thing that you were doing, you would invite them to stay and be a person, a guest in, in your company, but not talk about other people. What do we call that? Gossip. So, so you had people back in the day that had heard about Jesus, but they didn't know, so they were coming just to see him, to see if this was really true or just another charlatan where people had made up stories about him and he was blown out of proportion. So they didn't know, some of them didn't believe, some of them didn't care, they just wanted to see a show. And then there were the others, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they had come because they wanted to disprove what they'd heard. Or if they'd seen, if they had been an eyewitness, which some of them had been, 
They wanted to discourage anybody else from believing what they had actually seen because they were threatened by the power, the power of the, the, the fruition of Scripture, the power of the, of the reality of God working in their midst. Because up until that point, for most everybody, perhaps, it was only the eventuality of God working in my life. One day God's going to. One day Jehovah's going to. One day Elijah's going to come. Not in my life, not yet anyway. To have God actually acting in the midst of the people, what a threat to authority. What a threat to those in power. So discourage that, even if I've seen it myself. Even still, you would think that those people, mostly all of them, but not all of them, were Jewish, would have connected what Jesus was saying about the Good Shepherd with the 23rd Psalm. Well, you don't have to stop there. They could have connected it with the 74th Psalm. We are your sheep in your pastor, pasture. Or the 79th Psalm. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture. Or the 80th Psalm, you are the shepherd of all Israel. Or the 95th Psalm, we are the flock led by his hand. Or the 100th Psalm, we are the sheep of his flock. Or many people, if they couldn't recall all these Psalms, would certainly know Ezekiel. So this is an incredibly important piece of scripture because it, it's, it's part of the little apocalypse, the, the telling of the coming of the Messiah. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on the day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them to their own land, and I will pasture them in the mountains of Israel and the ravines and all the settlements of the land. So you think that the people would hear this and say, oh, I know what he's talking about. God has, God has explained God's self and been taught as the shepherd of God's sheep, the people of Israel, since way back in the Old Testament. But we hear that they don't get it, do they? Because it says right here, Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. Well, I would say some of them again. If I wasn't with Jesus over the last three weeks or a month and seen what he was doing, and I hadn't had that intimate connection, if I just walked up to hear this itinerant preacher preach, and he launches, in, he launches into this, this uh, description of what pa uh, shepherds do, okay, I can imagine that might be kind of confusing. I came out to see Messiah, maybe, uh, you know, a really powerful prophet, and this guy's talking about agrarian practices. What is he talking about? Is this the same guy? Is this the right guy? So he changes it. This is the second part. He's trying to get through with another word picture. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. So this is a leap. A leap for us, surely. How can someone be a gate? Someone can be a, a, a shepherd, but a gate? So let's stop for a minute and talk about sheepfolds. Think of Ireland, okay? When you think of Ireland, what do you think of? Sheep and what? Stone walls everywhere. Um, lots of stones in Israel, same as, as in uh, Ireland. And so sheep folds are made out of stones. They're about four feet tall walls, sometimes five feet. Uh, they're square or kind of square. And they have a gate opening just like this right here. It's usually a little thinner. Now, if the sheepfold has been around a long time, they will plant this bush that grows there. It grows big, it gets unruly, it takes over, and it has these long two-inch thorns and kind of a wiry, vine-like consistency, something that you could take and cut and shape into, let's say, a crown if you wanted to. So this would grow all along the top of the sheep, sheepfold for Two reasons. One, to keep the sheep in, and two, to keep the wolves out. And the wolves might be of canine origin, or they might be of two-legged kind. You know, at night, when it's dark, a bandit 
coming over the back of the wall and lifting out a sheep to go home and eat well or to sell? Bandits and thieves. So the shepherd would bring his sheep into the sheepfold and keep them there for the night safe and sound. But there was no wooden gate, very rarely, across the sheepfold because there's not a whole lot of wood there. You're certainly not going to cut down an olive tree to make a gate. They did have wood, but wood was precious, and it was used for building homes or keeping up mud walls and stucco. No, you didn't need a gate anyway, because once the shepherd gets the sheep into the sheepfold, and they were bedded down for the night and everything's calm, it was time for the shepherd to sleep. And where do you think they slept? Across the door. The shepherd became the gate block the sheep from getting out, they wouldn't step over them, and block bandits from getting in because they wouldn't step over them. You don't want to wake the shepherd up trying to steal a sheep. So Jesus says, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. So now if people were understanding anything about being a, a shepherd, they certainly did, they would say, oh, he's, he's laying down at the sheepfold so the sheep can't get out. All who came before me were thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. So now he's mixing the two together. He's saying he is the shepherd and the sheep, which of course would be right. But he's also saying that the ones who came before him as shepherd and as gate were thieves and stolen and killed and hurt. Now to understand what he's saying here, there may be a need or the people that were following him had an advantage because if we go back in John's gospel, two chapters to chapter eight, and by the way, this is all happening pretty fast. It's, it's separated for us because it's in our in our lectionary, but for them it was happening pretty quickly. Just, just a little while ago, Jesus was, was having it out with some Pharisees and some Sadducees and some scribes, and, and he was telling them, I know my Father's voice, and I listen to him, but you don't know his voice because you don't belong to him. I'm doing what my Father tells me to do, but you're not because you can't hear, because you're not one of his. Now, if there's ever a a passage in part in scripture that's talking to Jesus. You want to talk about Jesus always meek and mild and saying, I, you know, everybody's great. This is certainly not one of those times. He's very clear. I'm in, you're not. Right after that conversation with the Sadducees and Pharisees, he goes and he finds the blind men, one of the blind men, because there's several of them in scriptures. This is the one that he puts mud on his eyes and he tells him to go wash in the pool of Salaam. So what is the significance of this? Well, he's told the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they're not part of God's flock. They're not in. They can't hear his voice. And then he goes and he finds a man who has been kicked out by the shepherds. The shepherds who can't hear God's voice have taken on the power to kick people out of the flock. Because as a blind man, he's polluted, he's sinful, he was grotesque, and he's not allowed to be with anybody. And Jesus seeks out that lost sheep who has been kicked out of the flock by usurped authority, and he heals them, and he sends them back in. Not just into the community, but back into the healed community of his family and of the people who believe. And it is through the witness of his healing that those other sheep, the people, would turn again and more deeply to God. For only God can do this kind of miracle. We hear it in Scripture. He says it even to the Pharisees who are questioning him and trying to convince him that this was an evil deed, the man says, I don't know, but how is it that you don't know? I know that in Scripture it says that no one can do these kind of things unless they are of God. And this man did these things. Why are you saying he's not? So Jesus has, has condemned some and restored one, and now he's telling this story about the sheep who have been misdirected by shepherds who have usurped authority and how he is the one who will heal and revive and bring them back home. Peter gets this later on, doesn't he? As we read the, the second lesson for the day where he says that he died for us that we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd, the guardian of our souls. He knows Jesus. He's heard these words. He's heard these words over and over. And so repeating them now, this is a post-resurrection discussion that he's having here, preaching to the crowd where the thousands of people are baptized. And in the first reading Acts, that's actually post-Pentecost for us today. 
This book of Acts, this is an image of the believing community in its newborn, pristine self. No corruption yet. No brokenness. People living together, giving away what they own and coming, providing for everybody else. Making sure everyone is cared for. Making sure everyone knows that they're loved. Making sure that everyone gets educated and understands the love of Christ. Of course, it doesn't last. never does. So this, this imagery is what's brought to the people. And the teaching is that they know, he's, Jesus is reinforcing, know his voice. They know him if they'll just listen. Maybe they haven't been able to hear for a while, but, but now they can. We have this terrible process going on in the 21st century. I always say that there's times like every other time, and it really is, because sin and, and hardship is the same, doesn't matter what period of time you're in. But we've got this added problem with technology. You know, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, and it's inundating us. And, and all of technology wants a piece of us. Whether it's the radio or the TV or the internet or, or whatever it might be, everybody is speaking to us, and they all want us. They want us to improve their ratings. They want us to improve their wealth. They want us to improve their product share. They want us to improve their image so they can get reelected. But I can guarantee you that none of these people care about you. They don't care about me. They may care about you in the moment, like if you're out and a politician shakes your hand and tells you you're just the greatest thing in the whole wide world. And if you have some problem that will do well for that politician to get you on TV or use you in a speech, they'll do that pretty happily. But then you won't hear from them again, especially if they get reelected. They don't care about our mental health, about our emotional health, about our spiritual health. Everybody's in it for themselves. That's just the way that it is these days. And I say it's been that way forever. We just haven't been inundated by it by so many different directions. It's in this time of our life that we have to very clearly be able to hear the voice of the shepherd. And we can. You've done this, and I've done this in, in my own, in your own lives. I know you can tell stories. I'll, I'll tell one. And I don't remember how many years was it ago we were at Disney. Was it seven, eight? Uh, <laughs> a lot. So we went to Disney, and we would split up now and then. I would take the girls and go to one ride, and Jenny would take Will and go to another ride, or she would take one and two, and I'd take one and two, or whatever it was. And we'd come back together. We'd say, I'll meet you in a half hour at Mickey, or at or, you know, Goofy, or one of the places that stands out. And I remember there's this place in Magic Kingdom where there's a, a place to eat, and it's, a, you know, it's thousands of people walking by, going around all the time. And I don't know if it was me or her, it's probably me. I had gone and was standing in the wrong place, or I was walking by going to the wrong place, and amidst all these thousands of people who are calling their children and getting oohs and ahs and shrieking and saying, oh, look at that, look at this other thing, I heard far away my, my name. And I knew the second, no, before a second, a nanosecond, the, the time it takes for you to think a thought, that was Jenny. Because I know her voice. And I began to look. Stopped me dead in my tracks. I know this has happened to you. It's happened to all of us. How does it happen? Because we know that person so well and so long that when they speak, we hear them. And when we hear them, if we are in need, we are relieved immediately because we are found, because we have come together. How do we clearly hear Jesus' voice, the voice of the shepherd, the voice of the gatekeeper, the one who will, will lay us down in green pastures beside still waters? We pray. We spend a lifetime praying. We take opportunities to pray, every opportunity to pray. Can't sleep at night, can't wake up in the morning. Can't do, can't be, want to be, are doing. Giving thanks to God. I spoke with a, my, my, uh, my house met yesterday for a day-long retreat. Blessing to everybody who was there. Alberta's house, Albert the Great. I'll tell you about him someday. And I, I shared with the community 
when some questions came up about being comforted in the process or in the companionship of the other. That we live this way, we live for this in our lives. It was a question that came up several times. The reassurance that we all wanted to hear. We, we know it, but we need to hear it. That in every moment we should look for the presence of God in everything that's going on. And give God credit. Sounds silly, doesn't it? I find a, a parking lot a parking spot close to the door, or, or I look out the window and I see a bird in the bird feeder that I haven't seen in a while, or whatever, you know, things that, that everybody just passes over as the happenstance of the day. Why not thank God for it? Why not turn to God and say, thank you for this, thank you for that, thank you for this moment where this is happening? Drawing ourselves closer in contact and communion and fellowship with our Lord. The second way is the Scripture. To turn to the Scripture, to, to read the Scripture, to hear the voice of Jesus repeating and speaking and talking and, and giving us these lessons. I may not fully understand them or comprehend them, but I'm hearing His voice in another way. And that voice will grow, God bless you, in ways that I cannot comprehend right now. Filling and providing We're pulled like taffy by the people who want a piece of us. We're protected. We're cared for and loved by the shepherd who claims us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul. Amen. Please stand with me. Together we will say the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. The third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. 
Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light of shine upon we praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and for those of others, especially for those in our parish family, including Chester Cousins, Darian Preston, Thomas Sedan, Marian Wright, Laurie Thompson, Mike Thompson, Vanessa Preston, Sue Burke, Caleb Shomo, Chester Wright, Melanie Ackers, Kathy Barkley, Bill Medlin, Ann Lynn Stone, and Father Bill, and also for our extended family and for those who we speak aloud or silently in our own hearts. Christopher and Sister Rosie. Pray for Tom and for his wife. Pray for Mildred, for peace and direction. I pray in thanksgiving for the gift of our parish family. Ever-living God, whose will it is that all should come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, inspire our witness to him, that all may know the power of his forgiveness and the hope of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The service continues with the confession found on page 360 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Okay, that's good. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> Please be seated. Wonderful, wonderful to be back. What a glorious day, too. It was storms at 5 o'clock this morning and again at 8.45 uh, or so, but it looks like it's cleared up a little bit. Uh, just wonderful to be back with you. I, I say... Uh, first off, thank you so much for your prayers and the cards and the well wishes and the, and the inquiry. It really is a, uh, a, a comforting thing when you're down and out to be um, thought of and to know that you're cared for. So thank you so much, very, very much. Um, I'm doing better. As you can tell, I'm on my foot. <laughs> have a, a, a complication with my right leg that they can't figure out what's going on, but aside from that, everything is where it should be tracking on the, on the uh, recovery line, so I'm doing great. 
So thank you so much. Um, lots of announcements. I'm not going to go through all of them, just mention a couple that are important. One is at 3 o'clock this afternoon, right here in the church is the, uh, the Richmond Brass Cohort. The, the, our brass group that meets, it's ours, they meet downstairs, they practice here, and from here they go out and give concerts and do um, uh, appearances other places. So they are going to be here with us at 3 o'clock this afternoon, uh, and I hope that you can come back. This is a gift that we uh, give, and hopefully give to the community. So invite everybody, invite your neighbors and your friends and just anybody on the street that you meet. They can come in here, it's a wonderful, you've been to these before, you know how great they are. If you haven't been, then you need to come. Uh, it's great, these are wonderful people that are, are you know, to hear music at, at any time. Live music is a great thing. So if you can come back, uh, come back. If you can't come back, then let somebody know. And maybe your neighbors can come and would like to be here. It's three o'clock, no admission fee, just come on in and sit down and enjoy the music. Arts in the Park is next weekend. So we all pretty much know what that's about. And we've been uh, building our, our, um, our repertoire of people that are serving. And Don, do you want to add some information to that? Are we good or? Okay, that's great. Yes, thank you everyone who has done that. And like, like Donna said, if you have not uh, signed up, then now is the time. I mean, we're at the doorstep. We're on the, we're on the welcome mat to this event and need to have every, all hands on deck that can do it. If, I'll, 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 I could be speaking out of turn, Don, so stop me if I don't, if I do. But if you, if you can serve for two hours, you can't do it for the whole, the whole time, that's fine. You know, having you on board for two hours or even an hour is better than not if we have a whole. And these are not positions where you are running around and, and you know, tagging cars and doing stuff. Uh, we even have had positions in the past, and correct me if I'm wrong again, where we have like bar stools out there and seats that you can sit down on. So it doesn't have to be a type of thing where you, you know, don't envision this if you haven't done it where you're standing up for hours and hours or you're, where you're running around in, in, the, in the heat. So that's not it at all. So if you know, no preconceived ideas of it, let those go and go talk to Don. An hour is better than no hour at all if we need the help. And that's a great gift to give. All right. No, I didn't. Okay. All right. Yes, that is, that is something that they ask. It's not, you don't have to do this, but they ask if you can bring a can of beans or a can of something or whatever you've got. It's non-perishable that goes to the food closet. So one of their ministries, the brass ministries, is that they provide this space and give people who maybe normally wouldn't bring food. Uh, and I've been here when I've seen people walk in the door that I've never seen before, and they're, they're carrying two cans of Del Monte in their hands or some spaghetti or whatever it is to, to give to help the, the food closet, which of course helps our neighbors, our friends. I, I haven't said this in a long time, um, don't think of the food closet as a handout for people who are taking. Um, people that use the food closet are all kinds of people. Your neighbor, your next door neighbor may be going to the food closet. The food closet is there for everyone, and that includes the people that are in a hard spot. Like they literally, because they lived on a fixed income right now, are needing to pay a bill, and they are just short for the month. Yes. Uh -huh. And they tell me that they have seen a 75% increase, increase in the use of right. food So please, tonight, bring some canned goods. Yeah. Bring some, mm -hmm. something that people can use. You can always bring food. Yeah. Uh, that's what that, uh, that uh, yeah. shopping cart is in the narthex. People can't go by and go, what is that ugly thing doing there? It is our way of maintaining a, a reminder that you can bring food anytime in the middle of the week or on Sundays and just drop it, drop the whole bag into that, uh, that, that cart. Okay. Um, last one I wasn't going to say anything about. We got Shrine Mont Camps coming up. Did you want to say something about that? Sure, yes. Um, so it's our parish family um, weekends from the 16th to the 18th. We have a 
June. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, all if you, um, you know, any questions about that, see how they're going, and then you know, be sure that you're able to get up there. Um, uh, we, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we 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 have always known as a parish family that going to Shrine Mon is really really important, and that we want everyone to go. Uh, and and we decided that money was not going to be the thing that kept people away. So we have a scholarship fund at Creator for people who need a little help paying the, the tuition or, the, or the, the fee that we pay to be up there. So that's just there to use. It's no harm, no foul, no one knows about it. It just happens, you just need to let me know and it doesn't go any place. What just happens is that you let me know and then you go, ta-da, done. So don't, don't think you can't go and don't be you know, like, I can't ask, I can't do that. Yes, you can. It's, that's why it's there. That scholarship has been built by your brothers and sisters in good faith to help out their brothers and sisters. So if you need that, don't, don't let funds be a barrier. It, come and, come and uh, enjoy the fellowship. All right, so the last one I'm going to talk about real quickly is uh, we have this thing down here. We have a GoFundMe page. There's a GoFundMe page, and I have to say, if you go to it right now, it's pretty bare bones. Uh, Mary got it up and running before I went into surgery, and uh, there wasn't time to write a dialogue piece about it. So I need to write a dialogue piece and get some more pictures in there of our, of our boiler hole. It's, it's to replace the boiler. So I said to you before Christmas, remember we all had the bishop downstairs in the parish hall because we didn't have any heat, and we had to repair the boiler. And I said back then, what they told me was, uh, this boiler is well beyond its life and it could go at any time. You do not want to wait till next year because it'll get running in the middle of the winter and it'll be it and it'll be done. So we, we put that on the Vestry's agenda and we started this GoFundMe page thinking we have, you know, a lot of time. Well, we do have, we have six months. And this has become all the more important because the boiler blew out yesterday. And was it yesterday or Friday? Yesterday. So uh, the boiler basically just blew apart. I mean, it didn't explode, but we got a call. Don was very gracious enough to go over. I was doing leading this retreat or partially leading retreat. Um, uh, Chris was here. He came and, and found that there was. Yep. Uh, I spoke Chris, with. Call. Absolutely. Um, Gunlock was the folks that rebuilt the boiler for us. Uh, the they supervisor came over. I spoke with him last night. I called him on the phone. He called me back. He said that it's um, basically the heat exchanger in the boiler has just split right down the middle. It's a two two foot fissure all the way. And he said there is no way to repair it. You, it, it. It can't be done. So you're just done. So this makes our GoFundMe. <laughs> And our awareness of what is ahead of us really, really important. Um, the, the, we've already got bids for the boiler. The boilers are not cheap. They are a major, major um, uh, 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 expense. Uh, and so we're really going to have to jump on this. I'm going to meet with the vestry. And we're going to talk about how we can move forward with this and then begin a process. I can tell you that we've already started that by applying for a grant from the diocese, which we were granted which we were awarded, and it's only, it's only $5,000, but it is uh, one step forward trying, beginning the process, and we're looking in some other places for uh, other grants to, to help bolster that. They're about $90,000. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty-something years? Yeah. Yeah, it's, 
it's beyond its life. When they came and looked at it, they, in fact, I can tell you, I've told you this before, when they repaired that boiler, it took over a week. Remember, it happened, and I said, I think we can get into our church before the bishop comes. And then it didn't happen. And the reason why is because the parts for that boiler had to be made. They couldn't buy them anywhere. They, they had to send off, in, in Wisconsin, they, they built one piece. And in Ohio, they built another piece, and then they shipped the one piece to the other piece, and they welded it all together and made the other piece. So you just can't, it's just, you can't get it. It's all done. Now, the boilers that they have now are not this kind of boiler. They don't even make these, these kind of boilers anymore. They are a completely different format, and they have to restructure all the pipe work in that room. It's just, it's not con configured the right way. So it's a big deal. Of course, it'll last well beyond us because the things are made so much better and the technology is so much better, but that doesn't help the fact that we have to, we have to do this. We have to enter into this. So look for uh, announcements as to how we, we're, we're planning to move forward and then just spin those wheels about ideas about how we can make this happen. And if you have any knowledge of grants that are available or any foundations or anything, uh, nothing is too wild and crazy or out there. We can always ask and get the answer no. But it won't, it won't help us if we don't ask. So there you go. All this, all with this, to the, to the backdrop that Jesus is Lord and he's resurrected and no matter what happens, uh, he's the good shepherd. And so it's going to be okay. It's just another big hiccup. We have those every day, don't we? So it'll be, it'll be all right. All right, birthdays. Anniversaries. Let your light so shine before all that they may see of your good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. When we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
Let us pray. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts, and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit, that through the Holy Spirit we may make Christ known, and through the Holy Spirit, at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen.
Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.